So my name is Kylie. I am a Canadian registered nurse and I identify as a bi woman. Um, the research I'm going to be presenting today examine the research question, how does having a bisexual identity influence cisgender women's health risks? So the literature review that supported my research was inclusive of studies from 2009 onward. The main takeaways from my review are that there are very few Canadian sources and that the bi population is often conflated in health research with that of lesbian and gay populations. The largest two areas from my review um, were mental illness and risk behavior. And from this, bi women emerged as high risk groups for mental illness, substance use, and sexually transmitted infections. However, I noted that most of these only identified association between bisexuality and illness or between illness and individual risk behavior, which I uh, found as problematic because this inherently pathologizes bi identity and suggests that more contextual information is needed. This ultimately led to my uh, interest in completing this study where I aim to contextualize these health outcomes by examining some of these complex social, cultural and systemic factors that are relevant to health. So to recruit my participants, I used these inclusion criteria on the left of the screen here. Um, I brought my participants into the study through purposive sampling of an LGBTQ plus support group. And then I was also granted permission by the REB to uh, sample from my own network within the bi community. This gave me a total of four participants, um, which partly I attribute to the pandemic. I was in the middle of conducting the study right in the heat of, thing, in the, of the first wave. Um, the data were obtained through recording participants' oral narratives, both in person and then via Zoom as a response to the pandemic. So I took a critical qualitative approach and I relied on Lieblick et al's narrative methodology and I used the notion of liminality as an interpretive framework. So Turner and Douglas conceptualized liminality as an experience of being perceived as quote, betwixt and between. Uh, this is characterized by ambiguity and unclear role expectations. And to clarify, I do not view bisexuality as being in a liminal space. I suggest that uh, society views bisexuality as liminal. So on the right of the screen here, I constructed a visual representation of my findings. And then on the left, I've given just a couple of short quotes for each sub theme. So all of my findings related back to this notion of the sexual binary. And this is the idea of sexuality as constructed around heterosexuality or homosexuality. And I found that my participants were commonly talking about their identity in reference to one of these two poles. The main narrative theme that emerged from this was then the idea of erasure, which Flanders and all uh, define as the systemic denial of bisexuality. And then Sherry Eisner, our, one of our keynote panelists, um, define this as a, involving a production, generation, or maintenance of cultural knowledge that erases bisexuality. So my findings suggest that the sexual binary is relevant here because that is what is producing, generating, and maintaining the cultural knowledge that affects our health. So the segmented circle here were then the different experiences of erasure that came through in my findings. The first was invisibility, which occurred when participants described having their bisexuality misinterpreted as either heterosexual or lesbian, depending on who they were with, uh, how they dressed or how they looked. Erasure through inauthenticity was then um, being dismissed, denied or questioned. And then the sub theme of commodification highlighted how bi identities are sexually objectified and this allows people's identities to be reduced to its entertainment value or ability to facilitate sexual activity, which reduces their personhood. And lastly, this uh, idea of self erasure was where the participants played some role in concealing their identity, but notably this was motivated by um, a desire to maintain the relationships that they had with friends and family, but interestingly also with their healthcare providers. So these sub, sub themes I then connected to different health risks. For safety, it became apparent that from being commodified, participants faced physical and sexual safety risks, which included sexual coercion and then for one participant rape. Uh, the health risk behaviors involved substance use, sexual risk taking. Um, for example, some talked about using substances to feel comfortable in social settings, particularly queer settings, um, others to manage feelings of inauthenticity, and then others to facilitate sexual activity. And then this last sub theme relates to the healthcare encounter. So this was where the findings showed that healthcare providers are functioning in within this binary model of care. And this affected the participant's sexual health education in that it was very limited. And the therapeutic relationship as well suffered as a result of this um, way that they were providing care. So the key importance of my study findings, uh, I believe relate to the way that they can inform much needed changes to practice education and policy. With regards to healthcare practice, my study demonstrates that healthcare providers, we can't know based on the way that somebody presents um, if they are bi or not, or what their identity is. And Hayfield and all literature uh, supports this. 
So I'm suggesting providers reflect on their own monosexist assumptions so that they can be providing more relevant care. Uh, more specifically, my participants suggested that um, this could include demonstrating your inclusivity by uh, wearing, um, having visual symbolism. So wearing a bi or a pride pin or a flag on your scrubs or whatever your uniform is, um, or, and using inclusive language. Additionally, my findings suggested that isolation from LGBTQ communities, as well as wider society, relates to perceptions of bi and authenticity. And this is important considering Feinstein and all identified substance use um, has been a potential coping mechanism for dealing with bi exclusion. So I suggest providers consider implementing the harm reduction approach um, when we note that the, uh, substance use could be made more complicated for those who identify as bi. And lastly, in terms of practice, Flanders de Vincent and all explained how being perceived as inauthentic places pressure on bi. Uh, people, but by women to provide sexual evidence of their identity, and this is referred to as the burden of proof. It's therefore important for healthcare providers um, to assess how bi women are responding to that pressure, particularly in the context of consent. So when we note that bi women report more severe and uh, more frequent rates of sexual victimization than both heterosexual and lesbian women, uh, I suggest this is very important. So I want to clarify, um, and, and Sherry Eisner talks about this in her book, but um, the pressure or sexual behavior alone is not a health risk or is not problematic. Um, it's the pressure to engage in sex without safe sex knowledge or without full consent that presents health concern. So um, moving on to education, uh, my findings support the need for changes to the way that healthcare providers are educated. And this is because the literature shows um, that we just largely are not educated on how to care for LGBTQ patients, uh, plus patients. Um, so this means that we're, we're not equipped to be providing relevant resources or um, specialized care. So I'm suggesting that bi curricula be incorporated into healthcare provider education with specific focus on addressing things like bi erasure, uh, bi health challenges, understanding the prevalence and effect of health disparity among our population, and then providing effective support and promotion. And this curricula needs to focus on sexual health as well, including the consent process, um, how, to how to educate patients about safe sex with multiple genders, and how to provide care from the trauma-informed approach. And at the federal level in Canada, uh, the Canadian House of Commons supports these changes as they've uh, recommended modules on gender and sexual diversity be incorporated into healthcare pro provider training. And this could be very um, feasibly accomplished through virtual simulation gaming, as we have Canadian researchers, Luke Takar Flute et al., one of those researchers was on my thesis committee, um, they developed virtual simulation games that are uh, widely accessible to nurses, nursing students, other healthcare providers, and um, they, would, they would make these educational changes, um, they, it would be a practical change. So lastly, the structural changes that are needed within the healthcare institution um, will begin to allow us to move away from our reliance on the sexual binary, and this can be accomplished through policy. So to address the lack of disclosure that's noted in um, the literature as well as in my own findings, I suggest that we change policy so that any health documentation which is asking about sexual identity include bisexuality or a free text option. This would begin to, I, I believe, facilitate disclosure, but also validate bisexuality um, and the bi plus umbrella in a more normalized way. And then finally, as is suggested in that House of Commons report, financing needs to be redistributed so that public health grants support initiatives, health initiatives in queer communities. And this should in spe specifically involve uh, locating funds towards bi inclusive health services. I suggest that each of these recommended changes will uh, systematically validate bisexuality in the way that right now we system or the system systematically denies bisexuality. So just before the question period, I want to highlight a few concluding thoughts. Um, I want to note uh, clearly that identifying as bi is not a health risk. Uh, rather, my findings suggest that the sexual binary is what is contributing to health risk. Um, and although my study findings center around the negative experiences of being situated amidst this binary um, by others, I believe bisexuality creates a positive potential as we have the option of choice and that is empowering. So in the same way that uh, we systematically invalidate bisexuality. These steps need to be taken to move away from the binary and systematically validate bisexuality. Um, and thank you all for attending this chat today. I'll now. Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Sofia Morales. I use she/her pronouns, and I'm thrilled to be in this space with you all. 
Uh, I'm particularly excited to give this presentation, which my colleagues and I have titled, as Julia mentioned, uh, by plus in disability and primary care, by plus health disparities, gaps in healthcare, and recommendations for healing the gaps. I'm speaking to you all today from Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, where I am a public health practitioner, public health researcher, and program manager for research and evaluation at Yale School of Public Health. Let me see if I can toggle to the next slide. Perfect. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank my colleagues who have been and continue to be instrumental to this work. Daphna Paulton is an LGBTQ and HIV researcher and a clinical psychology doctoral student at the University of California, San Diego. Kristen Dew, amongst the audience today, is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified sex therapist. They own a private practice, Growth Therapy, in Monroe, Connecticut. Dr. Kristen Wagner is a physician who specializes in infectious diseases and LGBTQ healthcare. Dr. Wagner is based out of Augusta, Georgia, uh, where she is an associate professor and the medical director of the Medical College of Georgia. Jackson Higginbottom, also a public health practitioner and researcher at Yale University and Yale School of Public Health. Jackson specializes in public health communications. And last but certainly not least, Melissa Funaro, who is a clinical research and education librarian at Yale University, specifically at the Cushing Whitney Medical Library. As you can see, we are a robust and interdisciplinary team, uh, really where the continuum of care as well as research are well represented. Uh, just to note, none of the authors have any known financial relationships to disclose. And now really to get us started and by way of background and, and to share the motivation for this research. Uh, bisexual, pansexual, sexually fluid, and other non-monosexual individuals whom we refer to as bi plus in this presentation, as we all know, experience greater negative health outcomes compared to heterosexual individuals, as well as other sexual minority individuals. The bi plus population who in fact make up the majority of the LGBTQ community demonstrate elevated risk for physical and mental health conditions. And we know that these bi plus health disparities are considerably driven by the unique stressors that are faced by this population, namely bi plus minority stress, which is really rooted in systemic bi negativity, bi phobia and bi stigma. And, and Kylie uh, was talking uh, about this during her presentation. Um, it's important to note that bi plus uh, people also face double discrimination in multiple settings. Uh, people who identify as bi plus are very often invisibilized, rejected, invalidated, and stigmatized in both the heterosexual community as well as within the LGBTQ communities themselves. All of these things are very much exacerbated in primary care settings. And again, Kylie, a lot of what you said really resonates with this presentation. Um, I know for me, uh, as a bisexual woman, uh, and for many that are attending this conference overall, this resonates, of course. It can be traumatizing to go see a primary care provider knowing that if you disclose that you are bi plus, so bisexual, pansexual, sexually fluid, et cetera, you will very likely be completely misunderstood and completely unaffirmed. And this is precisely what my colleagues and I decided to examine. We wanted to look at the literature more closely to see how the scarcity in evidence-based clinical interventions and medical education to meet the needs of individuals who identify as bi plus could be exacerbating these health disparities and health inequities in this population. So just to summarize um, our three main aims, first, we wanted to examine and summarize the literature that speaks to the specific health needs or concerns of bi plus people, and thus contextualize bi plus health disparities and the systemic and societal factors that influence them. Secondly, we wanted to begin to identify the gaps that exist in the research and in the literature regarding how to best meet the primary care needs uh, of this population and shed light on the impact of these gaps in the healthcare outcomes of bi plus people. And third, to begin to suggest ways in which we can improve clinical interventions in the primary care setting, as well as suggest areas for future research that can ultimately improve the health and well being of bi plus individuals. Here, um, we just wanted to share in terms of our methods, uh, we have completed the first phase of a scoping review, of a scoping literature review. We have developed a scoping review protocol informed by the framework described by Joanna Briggs Institute or JBI and the PRISMA extension for scoping reviews or PRISMA SCR. Our search strategy involved identifying uh, the relevant literature that pertains to the bi plus population and health and healthcare. Uh, some of the keywords that we utilized uh, for this search strategy include, but are not limited to, 
terms as uh, such as bisexual, pansexual, polysexual, plurisexual, non-monosexual, sexually fluid, uh, primary care, health, healthcare, clinical, uh, among other keywords. Um, our search strategy was led by an experienced clinical research librarian who conducted a comprehensive search of the literature using several databases. And then my colleagues and I, as content experts, screened the peer-reviewed uh, literature as well as the gray literature using a program called Covidence. Um, here on the right-hand side, you can see this PRISMA uh, diagram for our scoping review. It's uh, the first iteration of our, uh, of our scoping review. And I just wanna draw your attention to, to some of the numbers that you see here. Um, so we initially, we started with over 1600 articles um, after remo removing uh, some of the duplicates here, um, a little over 300, we were left with uh, a little over 1300 articles to screen, as you can see here. Um, more than half of these uh, articles were unrelated to our, our topic of interest, which again, uh, is the BIPLUS population and health and healthcare. Um, so then this, this left us with, now we have a little over 600 uh, articles that we are really needing to do full text review um, to finalize our, our findings. But we do have a sense of where things are and where things stand in the literature. So just to share some of the preliminary findings, um, much of the research related to BIPLUS and health often examine sexual minority individuals as a homogeneous group. Uh, this was also something that uh, Kylie mentioned. Uh, so really lumping uh, bisexual and, and bi plus individuals within the LGBTQ uh, umbrella as opposed to focusing on the bi plus populations individually. Um, this represents roughly 30% of the, of the literature, uh, which is fairly significant. Um, Another big piece, and, and Julia spoke to this too, um, much of the research that is about uh, bi plus and health is in fact related to HIV and men who have sex with men. Uh, this represents roughly 20% of the literature that we reviewed. Um, another key piece that we have seen thus far is um, that much of the research related to bi plus and health seems to be solely focusing on mental health as opposed to taking a primary care or preventative care approach. This also appears to be roughly 30% of the literature. Um, and as such, there are significant gaps in the literature that pertains to primary care and healthcare uh, for the bi plus population. And of course, there is certainly abundant opportunity for furthering research and education. So here we just have some uh, discussion points that we wanted to, to share with you all. Um, Precisely the scarcity in the literature, and specifically the scarcity in culturally informed, evidence-based clinical interventions and tailored medical education about the health and healthcare of the BIPLUS population, translates into inadequate and unaffirming primary care services, which in fact perpetuate stigma and discrimination, and may lead to BIPLUS individuals foregoing seeking healthcare altogether. Um, this is particularly concerning uh, in the context, you know, we, we know, we are very aware that uh, there are disproportionate negative health outcomes in this population. So knowing that to begin with and knowing that uh, this can lead to folks not getting the healthcare services that they need is, is particularly concerning. Um, as such, stronger provider-patient relationships can, of course, begin to improve health outcomes for BIPLUS people and more tailored and specific training and education on BIPLUS topics could begin to heal some of these gaps. Just to, to wrap up this presentation um, and, and to of course entertain questions and comments, uh, my colleagues and I have outlined some of the, uh, uh, just a few recommendations uh, for you to, to take with you. This is not meant to be a comprehensive list, um, but it's, it's certainly a good place to start. Um, we first wanna share, it, it is extremely important and we recommend considering health disparities of sexual minority subgroups separately. Again, going back to Kylie's presentation, right? Um, as opposed to lumping all LGBTQ plus communities and, and populations together. Um, looking at these separately um, is, is important um, because we, we have specific healthcare needs. Um, and when we lump everyone together, we don't get to see those nuances, right? Um, we also want to encourage primary care providers and clinicians to acknowledge and validate self-disclosure of BIPLUS identities. So if a patient has taken the courageous step to disclose that they are bisexual, pansexual, or just you know, overall BIPLUS, the clinician should begin by affirming 
uh, affirming this, recognizing this, that it takes courage to share this, knowing that there is by stigma, by phobia, um, et cetera. And uh, the clinician may even start by asking I, or indicating, I see that you've shared um, your sexual orientation as, for example, bisexual. What does being bi, uh, bisexual mean to you? And I do want to note, um, this is, goes back to something that Kylie mentioned, this should not be framed in a way that is requesting for proof of being bi plus, uh, but it's more to get uh, a better understanding and going back to building that uh, strong patient uh, provider relationship, to get a better understanding of that patient's lived experience and how they self-define and conceptualize their own sexual orientation, not seeking for, for proof um, that they are bisexual. And just a few other pieces, we also wanna highlight the importance of increasing awareness of structural and systemic factors that result in bi plus minority stress. Uh, you know, we mentioned at the top bi plus stigma, invisibility, double discrimination. These are all psychologically taxing uh, for this population and need to be recognized. Taking a trauma informed uh, care approach is extremely important. Um, it is also important to use multi-dimensional uh, definitions of sexual orientation that consider fluidity, variability, and intersecting minority identities. And last, but certainly not least, it is of utmost importance to engage the bi plus community in any and all research that is done related to bi plus and health. Um, we need to bring in and elevate our, our own voices. Uh, we know what's best for us. Um, and as such, it is important to, to be included in this type of work. I'm super excited to be here. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I'm a professor at um, Georgia Institute of Technology, and before I begin, I want to give you a little bit of background on who I am, because uh, research on bisexuality is not a huge part of our field uh, of where I am, or even really um, what we're trained to look at, but as a bisexual man, uh, it's obviously something I'm interested in, and there's this idiom of uh, me search, and so I was curious. Um, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist, so I study the psychology of work in the workplace, and um, I'm also an occupational health psychologist uh, because most of my research focuses on how work am impacts your health, and it's one of my um, studies from um, occupational health psychology that uh, this data comes from. Um, I'm also married to another IO um, occupational health psychologist. I've got this tiny little guy and another one on the way, um, just for context. So the um, larger study where the data that I'm going to be presenting to you um, come from, the focus is on how uh, your workplace leaders impact follower health behaviors, uh, because we know that stressors in your environment um, can impact how you engage with your environment, including things like exercise, smoking, drinking, et cetera. Um, and this larger study comprised of a baseline where we brought people into the lab, um, also ran into the COVID issue. And so that got put on pause, but we managed to pull it back together, um, brought them into the lab, took some initial health assessments, both um, physical measurements, as well as self-reported health behaviors, and then followed daily surveys for two weeks. Uh, and this study was funded by the American Psychological Foundation. Um, but for this particular uh, question that I had, which is really, what are the health behaviors that um, bisexual people engage in? Uh, are they different than monosexual individuals? So both heterosexual and gay or lesbian identifying people. And to you know, kind of bring this link to the forefront, um, there were two main theories that we're drawing from. The first is allostatic load theory. Um, which is this notion that you have some sort of stressor in your environment and you perceive it. And um, in response to that stressor, your biological systems are reacting. You're releasing cortisol. Uh, your body is adjusting to this new arousing stressor so you, you can fight it and overcome it. And then um, you return back to baseline and you're fine. Um, however, we know that if you um, have continued exposure to the stressor or to multiple different stressors, um, or the stressor is outside of your realm of ability to um, cope with, then you start to um, draw on other systems that you can't, aren't necessarily um, 
uh, used to drawing on or that aren't necessarily adaptive, including um, behavioral responses, things that are focused on the emotional experience of the stressor. So uh, things like um, engaging in uh, smoking or drinking um, or exercise, on the other hand, some people engage in exercise as a coping mechanism, et cetera. And then clearly these behaviors themselves have impact on your longer term um, health, both mental and physical health outcomes. There we go. Um, within the study, after um, getting uh, rid of data from individuals who um, didn't uh, pass our attention checks, we had 120 participants, 15 of whom identified as bisexual, which is really why I'm here. When I realized that I had this data set with um, not just uh, one or two bisexual identified individuals, um, I wanted to dig into this. Um, within there, um, four of those bisexual identified individuals were cis men, one was a trans man, and um, 10 were cis women. Uh, we had nine gay identified individuals, all were cis men, and then 96 straight individuals, 54 cis men and 54, or sorry, 44 cis men, 54 cis women. And um, why might there be a difference in the health behaviors that bisexual individuals are engaging in compared to monosexuals, um, both straight and gay? And to answer this question, um, or even really to ask this question, we turn to the sexual minority stress theory. Um, it's a subset of the larger minority stress theory, which is basically that if you're a minority, there are systemic issues that are external stressors, which again, turning back to that allostatic load model, you as an individual are probably not going to overcome systemic stressors. Um, so they're going to uh, create that wear and tear on your body. You're going to have to deal with um, behavioral responses that aren't necessarily designed to address the stressor. Um, and then when we focus on sexual minorities, um, particularly, I think, with bisexual and bisexual plus individuals, um, there are three sort of key things going on that might in, in heighten the level of externalized um, stressors that you're exposed to. Uh, the need or opportunities to conceal uh, your sexual identity and then the associated um, guilt and shame and other frustration that goes along with that, expectations of rejection um, in various circumstances, and then internalized by or homophobia, uh, again, depending on which sexual minority we're talking about. And then um, this stress theory obviously also links those uh, experiences to health outcomes. So by their powers combined, the idea is that um, sexual minorities, particularly bisexual individuals as sort of occupying this liminal space Space, um, as Kylie was suggesting, um, and sort of in that double minority where there's no real um, experience of a fully accepting community in either of the uh, monosexual communities, uh, we have this heightened level of externalized stressors, which should um, increase negative um, health behaviors, and then ultimately uh, worsened health outcomes. So within the study, we looked at uh, just a gamut of um, different experiences, behaviors, and outcomes. We looked at abusive leadership. It might be the case that um, bisexual individuals um, experience more abusive leadership, right? Um, that you were exposed to just a negative stressor because of your uh, bisexual identity, uh, work engagement as sort of a positive experience at work, that you enjoy your work, uh, you can throw yourself into it, health behaviors, um, use of alcohol, tobacco, sleep hygiene, so things like going to bed on time, not using um, your devices or phone prior to bed, um, not drinking immediately before bed or drinking caffeine, things along those lines that are designed to uh, create better sleep, exercise, oh, and then <laughs> I guess I listed tobacco twice, really excited about tobacco. Um, and then uh, health outcomes, so sleep, qu uh, sleep quality and quantity, uh, physical symptoms that um, people self-reported, fatigue, um, both mental, physical, and emotional fatigue, and then um, body fat percentage. Um, which actually was also measured using BMI, body fat percentage, and um, hip to waist ratio. And across all of these, uh, the only ones where we found significant differences, if my computer will um, uh, work with me, uh, was in alcohol use, work engagement, and sleep quality. And this is the point where I say, please take everything from this point forward with a grain of salt, because um, when we're comparing these really small groups, you know, 15 individuals to a group of nine individuals or to a group of 90, uh, these are really small numbers we're working with and our statistics aren't necessarily designed uh, to handle that well. I would have loved to have had another 15 or 30 or 45 bisexual individuals and similarly for uh, gay identified individuals. Um, but this is at least an initial look at some trends that we might see um, and um, 
significant uh, findings within even just a small sample. So diving first into alcohol, which is where we found the starkest contrast, um, the qu uh, question that individuals were asked was how many standard drinks um, have you had in the past two weeks? And we defined what a standard drink was. And we see that actually by plus individuals um, reported drinking less uh, in the last two weeks by about three drinks than um, either straight or gay identified individuals. Um, the, you'll see that the it's not quite at that P equals 0.05 level of significance when compared to gay individuals. That's just because that's a very large um, uh, variance going on within that group. Um, and so this stands in stark contrast to the hypotheses that we had, uh, right? That um, bisexual plus individuals as being this minority would be experiencing um, greater levels of stress and engaging in these coping mechanisms like drinking alcohol. And what we see is actually the opposite. Not quite sure what's going on there. Potentially, um, you know, if I had to speculate, and this is just pure speculation, uh, something about social groups and being part of an in-group, right? Alcohol is like, uh, is frequently used as a social uh, function or at social functions. And so it might be that bisexual plus individuals um, aren't as fully embedded in these communities. So there's less opportunity to drink in these social situations. Not sure. Also, something could have been going on because of COVID. Um, not entirely sure what was going on there. When we look at work engagement, we see um, that compared to gay identified individuals, bisexual plus people um, reported lower levels of work engagement, but they didn't differ significantly from um, straight individuals. Um, and then I do believe that the straight individuals reported uh, lower levels of work engagement than gay individuals. I just include here because we're not super interested in that. Um, and so it's at least in comparison to gay individuals, um, bisexual plus people um, might be less engaged at work, right? You could be distracted. Um, certainly we don't see this difference from straight individuals, but perhaps with a larger sample size, something might be going on there. And we might be starting to see, or at least in my head, I've crafted the story about sort of embeddedness in social circles um, that is linking up to these different health behaviors and health outcomes. And then when we look at sleep quality, so individuals were asked uh, to rate on a scale from zero to 10, um, what's the quality of your sleep? We see that bisexual individuals um, trending, these are just trending, but are pretty uh, close to significance, report uh, lower quality sleep than both straight and gay individuals. Um, and future directions, I think, you know, obviously if, to answer these questions, we need an intentional sampling of bisexual plus individuals. Um, and then also looking rather than the past two weeks or at the uh, trend level, looking at um, immediate reactions to stressors, right? These health behaviors might be occurring immediately shortly after exposure to stressors rather than just kind of on average, I think it would help create a clearer story there. And a quick shout out and thanks to my graduate students, Claire Burnett, Spencer Garcia, and Cooper Droz for facilitating data collection and running this study. Um, and then just a number of undergraduate research assistants. And I'll stop there. Perfect. Well, again, my name is Arielle Smith. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And today I'll be presenting a talk co-authored by Dr. Wendy Boswick and myself entitled, If I'm Bisexual, It's Like, What the Hell Is That? Microaggressions Among Racially Diverse Bisexual Men. And Dr. Boswick will actually chime in during the question portion today as well. So I'm going to kind of breeze through the background because a lot of the background has been discussed throughout today. You've heard how bisexual individuals experience significant mental and physical health disparities when compared to both lesbian and gay, as well as individuals who identify as heterosexual. However, to date, most bisexual health research, as we've been discussing, has focused on cisgender white women leaving a major gap in the literature as it pertains to the health of racial and gender diverse bisexual men. So it's been time for a while to move beyond and expand our understanding of bi men through a lens wider than mere sexual behavior and sexual risk, um, especially considering there's been limited uh, consider consideration given to the holistic physical and mental well-being of bi men. Um, and there's a lot of research that focuses specifically, specifically on sexual risk instead of their health and well-being at large. So the question becomes, why might bi men have poor outcomes than other monosexual men? And um, Keaton earlier mentioned the importance of the minority stress theory. Um, and I wanna go back to that because the minority stress theory points at unique identity-based stress, identity stressors that impact health. And it is true that there may be stressors unique to bisexuality as it pertains to both identity and behavior that impact their lived experiences. And these can be based on one's race, their gender and their gender identity, as well as their sexual orientation or the intersection of all of these things combined. 
So one hypothesized driver of these health inequities are commonplace slights or insults um, associated with minority identities, often known as microaggressions. And the literature has shown that microaggressions can be just as harmful as major discriminatory events. And Kevin Nadal um, conducted a lot of work surrounding sexual orientation and gender-based microaggressions and the impact that they have on LGBT people. However, his foundational work didn't describe the unique experiences of bisexual people or what these specific microaggressions may look like for us. So the major, the purpose of this work was to figure out what type of microaggressions do racially, ethnically, and gender diverse bisexual men experience? And this study is a part of a larger study called the Men's Daily Experience Study funded by the NIH. And the purpose of this study was to identify how the impact of everyday stressors, specifically microaggressions, and the impact it has on the mental and physical health of bisexual men. Today, we'll be talking solely about AIM-1 and identifying the context, the content, and the source related characteristics of racially diverse bisexual men's microaggression experiences and their responses to such events. So the Men's Daily Experience study that actually is composed of two arms, a qualitative component, which we'll be discussing today, but also a daily diary um, study, which we can talk about later during the question segment. However, for the qualitative arm, eligibility criteria included one, participants had to identify as bisexual, two, they had to identify as a man, whether that be a cisgender or transgender man, they had to be over the age of 18 years old, live in the Chicagoland area, and speak either English or Spanish. And about 90% of our sample were men of color um, in the age range between 19 and 61 years old. And we had seven transgender participants. We also had one interview that was conducted fully in Spanish, which was fun getting that translated and coded and all of that. So key findings were that bisexual men's um, experienced microaggressions related to their race, their gender identity, and their sexual orientation, as well as microaggressions at the intersection. However, today in the following slides, we'll focus specifically on bisexual specific microaggressions. We also found that these microaggressions came from many sources, um, their friends, their families, coworkers, helping professionals, like we heard from um, earlier today, romantic partners, along with members of within the, the lesbian and gay communities. There are also some indirect as well as internalized microaggressions um, that were noted in the narratives as well. And men discussed how these, micro, these microaggressive experiences impacted their interpersonal relationships. So the next couple of slides, I want to go over some of the bisexual specific microaggressions that came out in the narratives. And the first one I want to discuss is just general by negativity. And these are comments that are anti-bisexual, convey a dislike for um, bisexuality where people don't take them seriously, or they're more general and may not be directed specifically at an individual participant. For instance, one participant stated, I feel like a bisexual community is something that's hard to come by. I think it's still something that sometimes even looked down on, laughed at in the LGBTQ community. That's something I interact with specifically. There are comments that suggest bisexual men are not really bisexual, that they're actually gay. There are assumptions of infidelity, which we'll talk more about this later, and just comments that or attitudes that bisexual people are more likely to cheat on their partners and that they lack monogamy. And remember, these are all microaggressive experiences that these men have reported and they're not meaning that these things are true. Um, denial, dismissal, comments denying existence of bisexuality, suggestions that a person is in denial or just a rejection of the labeling. And I'll come back to this one um, in the following slide because I wanna make a clear distinction. However, one participant mentioned that one of my mentors, one of the gay teachers at the school didn't actually really believe in bisexuality. Uh, yeah, because there was another classmate and she was like, yeah, I'm bi. He's like, that's not real at all. And I know that was not, that was one isolated um, quote, but this was seen throughout the narratives of all the men um, interviewed. Additional microaggressive experiences reported was statements that bisexuality is just a phase. It's not a stable, permanent identity. Um, ad admissions from others that bisexual men should choose a side. Um, this participant stated, they told me that I was straddling the fence because you're in the middle. You have one foot over here, you've got one foot over there, just pick a side. And this also goes along with the following statements of promiscuity, um, assumptions that bisexual men are greedy. They want their cake and they can have it. They want to have their cake and eat it too. Anything that moves. 
Um, and the following microaggression was just unintelligible. And the reason that I said I'll come back to denial dismissal is because it's easy to conflate the two. Um, denying bisexuality means rejecting the label and rejecting its existence. Participants reported comments or expressions of confusion from others about their bisexuality. So this is a complete lack of understanding from others about how non-monosexual identities work. And that's where the title of this presentation came from, because one participant quoted, um, we were in a conversation, and he said, if I say I'm bisexual, it's like, what the hell is that? And the person was completely oblivious to what he was referring to. And the last one mentioned here is just you're confused. And these are statements that bisexual people are just confused about their identity and sexuality. Um, and one participant mentioned, being in the gay community, a lot of people when you say, oh, I'm bisexual, it's like, oh, you don't know, you don't know what you want, you're just confused and blah, 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 blah. And the list goes on. And this, again, these are things that have been frequently reported and have serious implications on both their mental and physical health, as well as their interpersonal relationships. So the question then goes, all right, who are these comments coming from? And a lot of times they're people who are close to those individuals, their family members, it's romantic partners. It can be individuals within the gay and lesbian community, which highlights the importance of not just clustering or viewing the community as one monolithic group. Um, the first quote, um, the first comment is from family and it's assuming that the participant's bisexuality is just a phase. The per this participant stated, she's like, okay, I understand. Maybe you're just confused. Don't be dead set on this um, because like life changes. You never know how you're gonna feel. Just kind of telling me that I'm confused and this might be a phase. The second um, comment regarding romantic partners, a lot of these comments were centered around promiscu promiscuity um, and infidelity and the assumption that the other partner was cheating. Um, this participant stated early on in the relationship, she said something slightly disparaging about bisexual men like how they're perverted, slutty, so forth, and so on, promiscuous. And I'm like, okay. And the last quote came from the gay and lesbian community. And a lot of these assumptions were that uh, surrounding just pick a side, you know, you want your cake and you can eat it too, or you're just, you're actually gay, you just don't know it yet. Um, and again, these, all of these comments had serious consequences um, for these individuals, mental health and their overall well-being. For instance, participants suffered this constant questioning of self and unwarranted cognitive and emotional labor. Um, and this had long-term implications for just how they perceive themselves long-term. For instance, this participant mentioned, I had that in my mind for so many years. I've been trying to convince myself that I'm just confused or that it's just a phase and that happened for so many years. And you can think to yourself like, these are just words, right? But they're not, especially hearing from this participant. Going, out, going on to the romantic partners, individuals may be reluctant to come out to people in general or their partners due to previous negative reactions and fears of how their partners will respond to their bisexuality. In addition, um, men may forego being their authentic selves because the pushback just isn't worth it. Um, this participant mentioned, it's always been things like that where just to avoid the conversation, I'm just like, oh yeah, I'm gay, whatever. So instead of committing to who he truly is authentically, he kind of just goes with the option that will yield the least resistance to satisfy or just to relieve the pressure. So moving into discussion, I know we'll have a healthy conversation after this. Bisexual men experience numerous microaggressions associated with their identities and these microaggressions often come from family, romantic partners and members of the gay lesbian community. Um, these microaggressions significantly impact both their social relationships as well as their personal health and their well-being. Um, and these microaggressions can also lead to internalized biphobia, which I included on like a separate slide, but I wanted to be mindful of the time here. However, such experiences have implications for their health their outness, their access to support, as well as their community exclusion. So I wanna thank our fabulous team, NIH, Dr. Brian Dodge. You see all the wonderful names on the slide. Um, this is our contact information and we will now open it up to questions and comments. Thank you all for the time. <laughs>